In this story, St. John Bosco deals with an anti-Catholic mob which ravaged his city of Turin. Inspired by Marxists and Freemasons, they wanted to remove all Catholic clergy from the education system. If you'd like to hear more about what gave rise to this riot, then you can watch another episode which I've linked above. But today, we're going to hear about an assassination attempt on St. John Bosco by a sniper. Let's go, boy. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Day in and day out in 1848, the Jesuits were made the target of a vicious stream of abuse and lies. A citizens' committee sought an audience with the King of Italy to request their expulsion from the realm. He didn't receive the committee, nor would he grant their petition, and so the agitators took to the streets to express the will of the Freemasons. A mob of Piedmontese revolutionaries and outlaws from other Italian states literally ran riot on the night of May 2nd. Screaming bloody murder, smashing windows and doors, they invaded the Jesuit house adjacent to the Church of the Holy Martyrs and their school of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, driving them out into the street amid imprecations and insults from the mob. The police appeared when all was over. The following day, the rabble stormed the convent of the Sacred Heart, but that time, the police kept them from breaking in. The convent, however, was besieged for a week. In reply to the Mother Superior's appeal for protection, the Minister of the Interior sent word that the King could do nothing for them. Consequently, the sisters had to return to France. The Jesuits, forced to scatter to the four winds on that tragic night, sought refuge in private homes. Father Guala sheltered many of them in the nearby Convito Ecclesiastico and gave them sizable loans to meet their most urgent needs. Don Bosco, too, did all he could to help, especially by providing them with civilian clothes to get out of the city in disguise. It was none too soon, because mob fury was soon followed by police action and all Jesuits were ordered out of the realm. They left unmolested, but in other parts of Italy, they were treated shamefully. Demonstrations were also staged against Marcio Nesparolo, founder of a Catholic boarding school for girls. The mob said that she had hidden 15 Jesuits in her residence. Her life was threatened, as though the girls sheltered in her institutions had been kidnapped from their parents and forcibly kept there. Such was the mob's gratitude for all her works of charity in Turin. Drunkards and loose women gathered in front of the refugio and hurled all sorts of insults, swearing to liberate the girls living there and burn the place to the ground. Their uproar could be heard at the oratory. Danger signs of new unrest among the seminarians, the imminence of war with Austria, and the disruption of studies at the University of Turin prompted Archbishop Franzoni to close the seminary. All seminarians who had taken part in political demonstrations were barred from sacred orders. Having been told of the archbishop's decision, many gathered in the courtyard and sang the popular Genoese patriotic anthem. So violent was the warmongering that many of the seminarians, giving up their priestly vocation, enlisted in the army. It was inevitable that these ugly events should adversely affect the oratory boys. After all, everywhere in town, within their own families and at their own jobs, they could not help hearing different opinions, some even favorable, about these demonstrations. Don Bosco tried privately and publicly to protect his boys against distorted judgments. He warned those in his care to never read the newspapers at that time because they were a bad influence. Although the book The Modern Jesuit hadn't been condemned by the church yet, Don Bosco forbade it for his catechists, teachers, and young students. He even read quotations from Gioberti's book which lied about their very own oratory of St. Francis de Sales. None of them, either then or later when that book was placed on the index, ever dared read it. They all regarded its author as a sworn enemy of the church, even though he was a priest. Because of his position against Gioberti, Don Bosco became the target of insults and threats. Indeed, an incident took place which, from the very beginning of the ill-conceived ideas of liberty, endangered his life and thus threatened the very existence of the oratory. 
Sorry, it got too dark out there, so I had to switch to my studio. But before we continue with this story, I'd just like to say that if you'd like to enroll in our Saturday Mass intentions for the promoters of St. John Bosco, just click on the link in the description below. Or you can wait till the end of the video and click on the Mass logo that should appear on the screen. Early one Sunday evening in the spring of 1848, while the oratory boys were attending their respective catechism classes, Don Bosco was in the chapel behind the main altar instructing the older boys. His topic was the boundless love our Lord has shown us in his incarnation, passion, and death. He was standing near a little window, which was closed, and was only a few yards from the wall. The light through an open door threw his whole figure into bold relief. Some hate monger, armed with an old-fashioned musket, was hidden behind the wall. Hoisted on the shoulders of an accomplice, he leaned over the top of the wall, and when his target was clearly in view, fired straight for Don Bosco's heart. Fortunately, he missed. A loud scream followed the shattering blast, and then an awesome silence as the boys stared in mute surprise at Don Bosco, shock and terror marking their ashen faces. The bullet had pierced the window pane without breaking it and had passed harmlessly under Don Bosco's armpit, slightly tearing the side and sleeve of his cassock and embedding itself into the wall, causing a few inches of plaster to fall to the floor. All Don Bosco felt of the bullet was a slight pressure, as of someone tugging at his robe. Not in the least disconcerted, he showed such calm and presence of mind as to allay the fear gripping the boys. He reassured them with a smile. What? Are you afraid of a joke in poor taste? It's only a joke. Some scoundrels don't know any better. Look, they've ripped my cassock and damaged the wall. Oh well, let's get back to our catechism. Seeing him so jovial and realizing he was unheard by the criminal attempt, the boys became their usual selves. After class, Don Bosco calmly presided at Vespers, preached, gave benediction, and then joined his boys in the playground. Here, a moving scene took place. They crowded around him affectionately, weeping and sobbing with joy, wetting his hands with their tears, and thanking God heartily for saving him so wondrously. Don Bosco, meanwhile, kept remarking, If the Blessed Virgin had not made him miss his aim, he would certainly have got me. But he was a bad shot. Then, looking at the rip in his cassock, he exclaimed, Oh, my poor cassock! That's the only one I've got! Meanwhile, one of his boys dug the bullet out of the wall and handed it to Don Bosco. It was a rather large pellet made to fit the rifles of those days. Don Bosco held it in his hand and showed it around, observing humorously, Look at that! Some inexperienced youngster wanted to play bocce, but he was a bad shot. There was no trace of the gunman who seemingly had disappeared behind the smoke of his own weapon. By discreet investigation, however, Don Bosco was able to discover the would-be assassin. He already had a criminal record and was then in the pay of a political group. He seemed quite certain to go unpunished. Had he perhaps been hired for the job? Don Bosco, who knew the man even before this incident, chanced upon him one day. Convinced that the culprit wouldn't dare to make a further attempt on his life once he realized that his identity was known, Don Bosco asked him abruptly why he had tried to shoot him. The would-be assassin was surprised, but not apologetic. Shrugging his shoulders, he replied brazenly, I really don't know. I guess I just wanted to see how deep the bullet would sink into the wall. You're a wretch, Don Bosco said pityingly, but I forgive you from the bottom of my heart. I wish we could be friends. Later, we shall recount other attempts on Don Bosco's life, especially when he began publishing the magazine Lechore Catalice to refute Protestant errors. It'll become evident that if this friend and father of youth wasn't murdered, it was only because God watched over him and often defended and protected him, even miraculously. If you'd like to hear about more attempts on St. John Bosco's life, just click on this playlist above me here. Oh yes, and if you'd like to enroll in our Saturday Mass intentions, just click on this other link. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.